What is up, everyone? Brandon First, a.k.a. First Report, representing the first Off the Bench podcast network. Everyone comes off the bench. We are first. Welcome in to another edition of the NFL Weekly here on the network where we break down everything, of course, the NFL has to offer. And it is time to look at the divisional round. This is kind of our last full weekend of football um four total games to saturday to sunday which we of course will get to and of course when i say we i mean myself and my friend and co-host raider jim you can find mr martinez at raider jim 1090 how you doing tonight sir hey i'm doing well it's uh wow what a wild weekend between basketball the playoffs and it, it still hasn't settled it doesn't seem like there's still a little bit of insanity out there Definitely. I mean, obviously, you know, there's an elephant in the room here on my side of things. Um, we'll get to my thoughts on the Eagles. I will say I had to go into my notes app and put down just three topics um, because this is a family show. And as Raider Jim can attest on Monday night when he got my text, it's best that uh, we didn't record that night because I was hot. I still am. I am still very, very frustrated. Um, but of course, we'll get to that, um, you know, we do talk about kind of what happened last weekend and um, just uh, get out ahead of it as well. Um, luckily, Raider Jim can't hear it. But if for whatever reason, um, there is some kind of audio on my side coming through, I do apologize. Uh, I got some, some construction going on right outside my window. But hopefully this noise canceling microphone is living up to its name um, and everyone just thinks at me like, oh, we don't hear anything. So that's perfect. But if it is there, I do apologize. It should not be there the rest of the week, um, but we shall see. But with that being said, obviously last week we did look at the Super Wild Card Weekend. And we also talked about kind of, you know, the, the, the quintessential Black Friday or Black Monday, I should say, when we do see NFL coaches being fired. Um, and it seemed like about 12 hours, 12 to 24 hours after we stopped recording, the news did officially break on Bill Belichick, um, and rightly so. I felt like he should probably have his own day um, to kind of have the news come out, but it was announced that he will not be returning to the New England Patriots, not a retirement ceremony, more of a quote-unquote mutual parting of the ways, kind of officially turning the page on the Belichick-Brady dynasty for the Patriots. Um, but, you know, when you have a coach that – affected the NFL, um, you know, for better or worse, for as much as he did over 20 plus years, uh, 23 years to be exact. Um, I do think there is a moment where we do kind of have to reflect on that. But Raider Jim, what were your thoughts? Uh, Belichick's kind of, as I said, mutual parting of the ways. And overall, you know, I mean, the, the, the legacy that he created, not only in New England, but really throughout the NFL. Yeah, and I don't... Uh... I wouldn't expect anything less from Mr. Kraft over there in New England, but the way that they handled that, uh, standing side by side and everybody just being uh, as complimentary and kind to one another. And like I say, rightly so, there's no, it, it's nothing but successful water under that bridge. And whether you like him or not, as I was putting together some notes for the podcast, I almost felt like I was preparing a eulogy. And when you, if you've ever had to prepare a eulogy, you really, the highlights of one's life or career really jump out at you. And let me tell you, when you really look at Bill Belichick, this guy was destined to be great. Uh, he was named, his, his godfather, he was named after his godfather, College Football Hall of Fame coach Bill Edwards, who as a college coach compiled a record of 168 wins, 45 losses and eight ties. As a professional coach, when he went to his one year in the NFL, he didn't fare very well with the Detroit Lions. And then he got out of coaching for a bit because he decided to get involved with World War II and serve. That is, Bill Edwards did. And then what happened? But, but Belichick, I knew some gentlemen who grew up on the campus of Notre Dame, literally. Their dad was a professor at Notre Dame. So Notre Dame was their playground. They got to run all over the campus. This is when it was still a school for just guys and get down on the field and all kinds of stuff. And they told me what a great experience it was. Belichick grew up uh, at Annapolis. Mm -hmm. Imagine roaming around the, the grounds of Annapolis 
he was very involved with uh, or, or very uh, intrigued by watching his dad do their work over there for the football team at Annapolis, started learning how to break down films and paid close, close attention. This guy has been a student of the game since he was a young man, a young boy, and even as a successful coach, he would still seek out Bill Walsh to ask questions about the West Coast offense. He sought out people. And then in 1975, this is how long this guy has been around. He got his first start on an NFL team in 1975, not as an assistant coach, as an assistant to Ted Marchabroda of the then Baltimore Colts. 25 bucks a week is what he was making. And from there, you know, he hung out with the Colts for a bit. Then he moved on to the Broncos for a season. After that, he went to, uh, to the Giants for several years where he was able to be an assistant coach capacity under Ray Perkins, and then, of course, Bill Parcells. And that's where he got his first two Super Bowl win rings when the Giants won Super Bowls 21 and 25. After that, he, he went to the Browns for a few years, 91 through 95. That wasn't, you know, the, uh, everything. He was, I believe, uh, lambasted for benching Bernie Kosar or yeah. cutting Bernie Kosar, who then went to the uh, Dallas Cowboys and got a Super Bowl ring as their backup quarterback. So that was kind of a criticism to uh, Coach Belichick back then, and then it happened. Uh, you know, he did do a, a, he went to one year to the Patriots in 1996, went to the Jets 97 and 99. Parcells leaves the Jets. They have it all. They make the announcement. Our next coach is Bill Belichick. Raw, raw. Here we go. He promptly resigned. One day into that, he said. I'm not going to be the head coach of the New York Jets. It was pretty much that brief as well. Off he went. That's when Bob Kraft hired him. Mr. Kraft hired him in 2000, where he's been ever since. What did he do once he got there? 266 wins, 121 losses. His postseason record, 30 wins and 12 losses. 17 times he led that team to the AFC East Championship. Six Super Bowl rings, numbers 38, 36, 39, 49, 51, and 53. And in 2003, 2007, 2010, he was the AP Coach of the Year. Overall, to this point, 302 wins, 165 losses. He's been involved with some controversial games like the infamous tuck rule against my Raiders back in the early 2000s. Uh, he was at Spygate is on his record. He's responsible for having Tom Brady take over in Drew Brett Bledsoe's place. And everybody, he got lambasted for that. What are you doing? You can't, how do you keep Bledsoe out of the game? Who's this guy? Yeah, well, we all found out who that guy was. So again, whether you like the, uh, the team, the organization, whatever, at some point you have to put all that aside and really pay due and give respect to his accomplishments and what accomplishments he has. Yeah, obviously the 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 records speak for themselves. Um, you know, I, I believe he is the most successful coach in NFL history. You know, there are going to be some people talk about Bill Walsh, um, Don Shula, and that's fine. And it's that's what sports are all about. It's all about kind of having those conversations slash arguments. But you have a very strong case if you put Bill Belichick as um, your number one and uh, you, you know at the same time yeah and at the same time it as you said there there was controversy I mean I believe if I remember correctly that if you want to call it a resignation letter I believe it was written on a napkin and it said I resign um, yeah. uh, as head coach of the New York Jets and he just signed it um, so there were a lot of people saying it would have been really cool if that's how he resigned from the Patriots <laughs> um, obviously a little bit more pomp and circumstance deserved, but yeah, it is one of the very, and, and ironically, he actually took over for Pete Carroll, um, in yes. New England. And it, it, so that kind of like conversion of, and then obviously P Pete Carroll would go on to USC and, you know, kind of kickstart his second career, if you will, or his second, you know, very successful um, situation, but Belichick, you 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 mentioned the number of Super Bowls, and not not obviously the six, but I'm talking about the 
you know, the Roman numerals. I think it was 38 was the first one and 53 was the last one. That is a span of 15 years. And we're not even talking about one and another. We're talking about bookends with four in the middle as well. The dynasty that the Patriots had, as much as I hate to admit it, um, was not only the most impressive, um, maybe overall, but in the situation. I, I mean, you go back to, okay, the, the Bears and the Steelers and the Cowboys and even the Niners, those dynasties, when they were going on, they didn't have to deal with the salary cap uh, and things like that. The salary cap has turned the NFL into the closest margin of all the four major sports. The difference between team one versus team 32 is closer than any of the four major sports. Now, baseball is a little weird because you play 162, but in a one-game situation, you're not going to see the Kansas City Royals take down the Los Angeles Dodgers too often, as much as you would see, say, the Carolina uh, Panthers take down the Baltimore Ravens or San Francisco 49ers. So having to do that in that climate, while also being all of it, um, Bill Parcells, the man he took over for at least for a day in New York, always said, if you want me to cook dinner, you need to let me buy the groceries. And that, of course, is in reference to if you want me to be your head coach, I get say in what players I bring in. And we haven't really seen a coach be successful doing both. We see it happen all the time. We see, you know, even Matt Rule or, you know, some of these hotshot coaches come in and they're given, you know, president of football operations and head coach, and it doesn't work. Belichick not only made it work, but he was the best at it, period. Um, I, I Hats off, hats off to, to Mr. Kraft. Yes. For having the wherewithal and, and you, listen, dude, I'm hiring you. That's what you want. That's what you do. You make it work all years. No problem. He had a business manager, if not a business manager. I forget the capacity of the the gentleman with the Patriots organization that he would often, uh, you know, they would, they, he would confide in him. They would talk, they would have meetings and it would kind of bounce things off of him. And that relationship, I mean, again, the numbers speak for themselves. Amen. And also at the same time, I do understand uh, there, there was a team around Belichick, you know, he, he's got his scouts and things like that, but for him to kind of hold that burden because one of the big things you like that separation is because the coach kind of has to have a personal relationship with these players. A general manager shouldn't, or it, it might be best if they don't. Unfortunately, it is a business. There's a lot of wheeling and dealing. And if, you know, maybe if you get a little too friendly with that backup right guard, your, your wives become friends or, you know, all kinds of things, you're going to have an uncomfortable situation at some point in um, all of that. But I, I did like the way it ended. Um, you know, at least obviously the way it ended on the field wasn't what Belichick wanted for the Patriots. But as you said, kind of the hand in hand, if you will. And don't get me wrong. I don't believe everything, you know, that Robert Kraft said that it was a perfect relationship for 23 years. You you hang out with anybody for 23 years um, for, you know, 80% of your life. There are going to be situations where you get frustrated and things like that. But at the same time, for it to last for 23 years, I think is really Correct. special. Um, and now, obviously, the question is, as I kind of alluded to, this wasn't a, pre a, a retirement. This was a mutual parting of the ways. Um, and the Patriots have already filled that gap. Um, they, they bring in Gerard Mayo, which was kind of the plan, I think, going um, forward all along. So they've already filled that gap. Now for Belichick, I, I think the big question is where now? And the Chargers are probably, um, you know, the Chargers are the favorites for him and Harbaugh. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. But he's already, um, he has already interviewed with the Falcons. And that would be an interesting one. Um, Bill Belichick to the Falcons, it 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 just doesn't seem right. And it, and it doesn't seem sensical. It's like Alka-Seltzer and Skittles. Uh, doesn't seem like that should work, but who knows? We shall see going forward. Um, and I think right now, this is the best head coaching crop that we've ever had, at least that I can remember since I actually, you know, started following the intricacies of the game, you know, let's just say since, you know, 2000 or something like that. I think this is the deepest with Harbaugh and Belichick and Vrabel. I mean, I, I think I alluded to it last week where, you know, Eric Bieniemy might be an afterthought this year, just because there are so many yeah. incredible 
coaches through no fault of him. There are just other more accomplished coaches. Um, so we'll see how that goes going forward. Uh, but it, it's definitely an end of an era in New England. And I think a lot of us expected it. Um, but it is still, it's kind of one of those things it's baffling yet not surprising if that makes sense you expected it but it's still kind of surreal to actually see it happen but you know so best question, of luck to, to bill hmm? question, question for you yeah how many seasons i'm undoubtedly he's going to get a head coaching position yeah how many seasons should he hang around before it turns into the muhammad ali effect which is see i think you getting keep climbing back in the ring and you mm -hmm. still got Flash, and you still got the name, but you're not quite as sharp as you used to be, and now you're getting hit. Now your teams mm -hmm. aren't going uh, double double figure victories at the end of the year. Now you're fighting to get a wild card. You're not running away with the division. You know, how, how many a, seasons? It's a great analogy, especially because I think of, you know, you know, Muhammad Ali, it's almost like you're the gaming commission, right? And it's like, do we really take this guy's card? Like, Who's going to be the one to take Muhammad Ali's, uh, you know, boxing license? And and I do expect, you know, the coaches say it all the time. They get hired to get fired. Bill Belichick's exit, the mutual parting of the ways, is the exception rather than the rule. Um, so more than likely, he is going to probably be fired. Who is that person? Me personally, I think for him... And, and I don't mean this maybe, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but I think he sticks around to get one more than Don Shula. I think he wants the record. I think if he already would have gotten the record, we would have seen the press conference be a quote unquote retirement because he wants to go. And, you know, I could also see it. Maybe he wants to go win a Super Bowl without Brady, a la Brady in Tampa. Um, so th I think there are a lot of things. I think the short answer, I think he's 20 away, 15 or 20 away. I'm going to say three two seasons. seasons out. Yeah, yeah. Th but like I said, the minute, and I don't think it's like, oh, he breaks the record week six and then he retires that day. <laughs> I don't think it's like that. Right. Um, although, could you imagine that's how he resigns? He writes it down on a napkin, leaves it on the press conference after week six or something like that. That would be incredible. But that would be my guess. Um, and obviously, I think as long as he wants to be a head coach, he will be given a job no matter what happens. Um, you know, going forward, even if it isn't successful in Sandy or wow, in Los Angeles yeah. with the Chargers. <laughs> but uh, that, keep, that would uh, be my guess. Yeah, I kept hearing yesterday, you know, oh, interviewed by the, the Falcons, interviewed by the Falcons. I just had this comical vision in my head. He's Bill Belichick. We'd like to interview you for the job. I, I imagine him walking in with one of those uh, 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 Crown Royal velvet bags. Yep. Opening it up and pouring out eight Super Bowl rings going, there's my resume. Yeah. And then you point <laughs> at one of them that says, hey, you see see how we have 283 diamonds on there? That's because we came back and beat you uh, twenty eight when you were beating us 28 to 3. So yep. anyways, what would you like to talk about? But yeah, it, it's uh, it, it, it's very surreal. It will be odd to see Bill, um, Bill Belichick on the sideline. Um, you know, that isn't a Patriot sideline. But the, one of the videos that did come out, was Bill Belichick and Nick Saban um, back in their Cleveland Brown days celebrating, um, you know, whatever, a win or whatever. And just looking back and going, man, if those guys couldn't save the Browns, no one can. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but it is a perfect segue into, you know, I, I thought maybe Joe Flacco was the one to be able to save the Browns. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, and I'm going to just get out ahead of it. Um, obviously, we'll get to our thoughts on Super Wild Card Weekend, and I'm going to pass it over to Raider Jim. But first, I do want to get my thoughts on the Eagles game. Look, it was a disaster, um, and the, everything that I didn't want to happen happened even all the way down to it being on Monday night because, I, you know, you, you wait all weekend for it. And for me, my mind doesn't really say the weekend's over until the Eagles – I know whether or not they've won or lost. So it was like going into work Monday. It was just like, ugh, felt like I was sleepwalking. Um, and then the game starts. And I mean, almost instantaneously, the Tampa goes right down the field. They only kick a field goal. So, you know, maybe you're starting to feel, hey, you know, maybe the defense going to make a stand. And then you see the offense come out and run the ball well early and then get away from it. Um, 
so I think next week I will do more of a dive into it only because if I get rolling folks, I don't know if I can stop um, right now, but there are three things that I do want to hit on. And first and foremost, this is what has to be talked about first and foremost. And it's Jason Kelsey. Um, now reports did come out that he did retire. And I think the optics of it, if you were watching that game, you, you kind of put two and two together. He's on the sideline. You can kind of see the emotion starting to boil up. Um, and you know, it's a wild card game. So I don't want to, you know, sit here and say, oh, you know, you don't cry over a wild card game. But I do think there was emotions of him realizing, oh, man, this is it. Um, and yeah, then him walking yeah. off the field. Yeah. Him walking off the field, the optics of it. And then, I mean, I woke up Tuesday morning and I saw the report. Um, Adam Schefter saying he had told his teammates that he is retiring after the game. Um, and then today we are recording on Wednesday, the 17th of January. Um, his podcast did, or, you know, him and his brother's podcast did drop. He did say he hasn't made any official announcements or decisions, but look, I, I think the writing's on the wall. Um, I, I do expect Jason Kelsey at some point to retire. And I also think for him, it's his, it's his decision to make with all due respect to Adam Schefter. I know he has a job to do, but that's not really his job um, to, to, to break stuff like that. And I think Kelsey, um, deserves to do it on his own time and terms. And if he does, um, as an Eagle fan, the only thing I can say is thank you. Um, this Jason Kelsey will go down as the greatest Eagle of all time. And with all due respect to the legends and in my mind, um, I should say, um, with all due respect to the legends of, on this team going all the way back to, you know, the Harold Carmichael's, the Randall Cunningham's, even before then, that um, I understand that. But Jason Kelsey was the best player at his position for, I would say, majority of his career. He also was instrumental in bringing a Super Bowl to the city of Philadelphia. He has, in my mind, the greatest Super Bowl speech ever, maybe the best parade speech ever in sports, um, in the Mummers costume. And if you know the city of Philadelphia, you know the Mummers parade is very, very popular. Um, so that's what he's wearing when you do see the the, the speech. I, there are a lot of my friends who are like, what's going on with him here? Like, no, mm. he's not trying to be the Joker. And you have to kind of explain what the Mummers are and things like that. Anyways, he embodied the city of Philadelphia and also at the same time not only what he did on the field that was incredible but it's magnified by what he did off the field countless foundations millions of dollars raised over the 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 13 years of, of his time in Philadelphia he has touched so many people's lives even today he uh stopped by uh his local McDonald's and gave his favorite employee his signed jersey just little things like that that we look at and we go, oh, that's not that big of a deal. But you don't see that too often in sports. Right. Jason Kelsey, the top of the top of the mountain, fantastic human being. Um, so once again, thank you to Jason. And uh, I do expect, you know, when it does come official, if we are still recording, I will have another moment to kind of take that. But I wanted to bring that up because – um, it, it does seem that uh, that is probably going to happen now. Also, Lane Johnson, um, Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham, they've been kind of running the one year deals um, the last few years. If they do um, decide to come back, I hope that the Eagles give them. I know uh, Brandon Graham did say next year is his farewell tour. If the Eagles bring him back, I have to imagine they will. Um, same thing for Lane Johnson. Haven't heard any really thing from Fletcher Cox. Um, now, flip side. Um, the negativity obviously around this team, look, I don't need to spell it out for you. Everyone saw the game or most people saw the game Monday night. I've been a sports fan for my for first sports memory was either the 92 or 93 world series. When Joe Carter hit the walk-off home run off Mitch Williams, I watched that game with my dad. And yes, I was maybe like two or three or four years old. That was my first sports memory. So going back, you know, almost 30 years. I'm I've seen my team lose more times than I can count a lot more than I can win. I can handle losing. It's not fun. And maybe in the moment I get a little dramatic, but I can handle it when it's all said and done. You take a deep breath and decompress. 
it's the lack of effort that I struggle with. There are plenty of teams this year that underachieved. However, there are not teams that underachieved because they did not put forth the effort. The Eagles are that team. That does boil down to Nick Sirianni. A lot of the talk pretty much for the last 48 hours has been will they or won't they, of course, in reference to firing him. Um, I think three weeks ago or maybe a month ago, you first kind of breached the subject with me, Raider Jim. And I was like, look, I think that's an overreaction. Let, let's just see right. how things go. I have fully flipped now. I do think it is time to move on from Nick Sirianni. And on the outside, you look and you go, this guy has made the playoffs all three years. You were in the Super Bowl last year. He's won 10 games over the last two years. He has the best winning percentage in Eagle history. However, the last seven games have been an abomination. And once again, I'm fine with losing, even to the Cardinals. Fine. They went out and they beat you. But it's the effort that is being put forth or lack thereof that really does frustrate me. And I do believe that boils down to the head coach. Now, with that being said, I've had 48 hours to kind of decompress. Like I said, I'm not going to say what I said to Raider Jim, but I essentially insinuated that I'd rather have Lassie coaching this team um then uh then nick sirianni and there may have been some colorful wor words mixed in there however when it's all said and done i have faith in jeffrey lurie um you kind of talked about robert Kraft bringing in bill belichick um it's kind of like patriot fans you just you have faith in robert Kraft. i have faith in jeffrey lurie he has been the best owner in eagles history and once again with all due respect to the past owners it's not close um, so I have trust in Jeffrey Lurie. Those exit interviews are apparently happening today. We're recording, and it's technically 8 o'clock Eastern time. Right. Um, so I can't imagine those meetings are still going on. So I have to imagine at some point tomorrow we'll get an answer whether or not they are moving on. Um, so once again, I have trust in Jeffrey Lurie. But at the same time, if Nick Sirianni comes back, the entire coaching staff ha has to be purged outside of Jeff Stoutland, um, the fantastic offensive line coach. Now. Switch it up. I kind of do that complete sandwich where I give props, get angry, and then I am going to give props to two players. Um, first and foremost, Jake Elliott. There was a lot of negativity around this team, and it really wasn't one side. It seemed like all sides of the, the, the team fell apart at once. Jake Elliott was par for the course all season. I think he was 30 for 32 when it was all said and done. He didn't cost us a single game and he kept us in a lot of games. He has to be shouted out. He is one of the best kickers in the game. And also a fantastic performance from Devonta Smith on Monday. He was incredible. Uh, he, he seemed to catch everything that was thrown his way when it seemed like Dallas Goddard and Quez Watkins couldn't catch a cold. Devonta Smith was that guy. Um, so once again, I will get deeper into this next week when I'm able to kind of pull the brakes when I feel like I'm going off the deep end. I don't think I can do that today. So for the sake of the children, it will be delayed for one week. But um, with that being said, Raider Jim, what were your wild card, uh, super wild card weekend thoughts? Well, I'm going to stick with the, the Tampa Bay Eagles game because I do have a question, another question for you. Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I asked you, is it time to go into full crisis mode? So now that it's done, now that it, we, we have an end to the Eagle season, is this a step back, take, take a deep breath, and they will be right back to where they were at the beginning of this season? Or is it going to be, are they further down in the valley than I think, and it's going to be a bit of a climb to get them back? I think they are in a bit of a valley right now and they do need to get climbing. And one of the main reasons is if the one thing that I'm almost positive of is you're going to have to replace the best center in football and ask anybody center is not an easy pit position to replace um, a lot of continuity, <clears throat> excuse me on that team. I think the pieces are there. I just, I get frustrated when it's, oh, A.J. Brown doesn't like the coach or this or that. Like, you guys are getting paid millions and millions of dollars to play a game. I don't think, like, I don't like, well, I shouldn't say that. But I've there are plenty of bosses that I did not like in my past. I still gave the best effort I could because I'm being employed and I have big pride in my work. 
That's my question is next season. Does this team, cause I do think this team kind of wrote on the coattails of last year's team saying, Hey, yeah, we didn't really get rid of anybody or, you know, we, we brought in some guys and, you know, Nicobe Dean's going to be healthy. Jalen Carter's here. Uh, Nolan Smith's here. We're good. And there wasn't that build. I think this was a team that was content and they didn't, they weren't hungry to improve. They felt like they, they were as good as they needed to be. And they just wanted to keep that. Um, That's a great question. And, and, I want to say they pick up right where they left off, but I would say I'm leaning towards there is there there are some holes that need to be filled, and going into next season, um, it's going to be very interesting um, with that. But I, I think they're they took definite steps back and they they got a little deeper yeah. into the canyon this year. So, well, I would you know sticking with that one game. I will tell you that opening drive was yeah. amazing that Tampa Bay put together. And not only was it just the drive, even if they only got three points and not into the end zone, I looked at the person I'm watching the game with and I said, let me tell you what's important about that. Not only did they not just get three plays and had to kick the ball, they just took five minutes off the clock. Mm -hmm. They are already starting. I said, those are body shots. In the, in the land of boxing, those are body shots when you keep the defense out there that long. And by the second half, if not even by halfway through the second quarter, I mean, you have had to listen to me for how many seasons now go off on the Raiders secondary. I thought the Raiders secondary had issues tackling. I could not believe what I was seeing. I, I really could. It's like, how is this team? How did they do it? How did they get from 10 and one to this? And how are they playing at this caliber? That aside, I always say, but give credit where it's due. Tampa Bay put together a great yeah. scheme, great scheme. And old, old uh, Baker, man, he made a lot of believers out of a lot of people who probably thought his days were behind him. But when he got to the Rams, they made the announcement on the team, uh, on the, the broadcast. When he did go back to the Rams for those few games last year, coach just told him, hey, man, have a good time. Play ball. Do what you can do, what you what you know you can do. And they said that took so much pressure off him. And he put together a good run for the Rams. Came in, brought the swagger with him. And when that, that little dude gets some, his swagger going, watch out. Watch out. And, uh, you know, as we get talking about the games this week, uh, I, I think it's going to be a pretty, pretty good game when he gets out there. The other games, uh, that kid down there in Houston, they're just to impress me week in and week out we both said brown defense isn't what it was well it was a lot less than what it was at one part uh, early on in the season the dolphins another choke job uh wow didn't they just kind of they, they just ran out of gas is what it was they didn't have it anymore uh, the rams what a great great effort talk about uh, how many yards Stafford had how many yards 367 yards he put together uh, and, and it just wasn't enough but still all in all I thought the games were pretty good it was nice to see the Packers uh, both you and I have a have a liking of that love kid out there in Green Bay and man didn't he put together a good game so uh, watch out it's going to be an exciting weekend coming up yeah, uh, that did kind of take the sting out of it, watching the Cowboys, um, you know, we, we joke about it. It's uh, it's uh, Dallas Dallas eliminated meme day because the memes and, you know, the pictures, it, it's it's gold for Cowboy haters. Uh, but and also one final thing on the on the Tampa Philadelphia game, you go back and you watch that game and I think it ended 32 to nine. Tampa could have scored 50 points if their wide receivers, they had, I think six drops in the first half and yeah. they settled for three or four field goals. It was 16 to 10 or no 16, 16 to nine, to nine yeah. at, at half and Tampa had dominated, but they had kicked three field goals as opposed to putting, you know, so it very well could have been 28, nine and, you know, go from there. Uh, but yeah, the CJ Stroud is, has arrived. I am going to say it. He has had the most impressive rookie season for a quarterback I've ever seen. Will he go down? I, that's a different story. But 
for a rookie to do what he's done and has continued to do incredible. And I think the one thing that I'm really impressed with him, Joe Flacco, and I don't know if I brought it up last week, but Joe Flacco had more interceptions in his, what, five or six weeks with the Browns than CJ Stroud had all season. Protecting the football is very important for a young quarterback. And this kid's already got it figured out. It's going to be a big showdown. We'll get to that Baltimore game. I can't wait for that one. Uh, but they're going to have to head to Baltimore. And then the the, the Detroit side of things, I, I am very happy that Detroit got the win for the city and all that stuff. But I was pulling so hard for the Rams because the way things had shaked out with the when the, when the Cowboys got eliminated and I'm looking at the bracket and I go, oh my goodness, if the Rams get lucky here and the Eagles take care of business next week, we're hosting a playoff game. So thank goodness the Lions didn't win that game. And now we're looking at, you know, uh, I'm kicking myself because the Eagles gave up a chance to win a playoff or I uh, have a home playoff game because they just didn't show up Monday night. But for the city of Detroit, 30 one years they've waited to see a playoff win congratulations to that city and uh i heard someone um ask one of the one of the lions what time do the bars close and they said tuesday so they're having a lot of fun in detroit uh be safe and, and michigan as well you know the michigan uh, wolverines got a national title so it's uh it, it's a good time to be a, a fan up there in michigan um big game coming up this weekend did you hear the reporter who talked to the Lions coach and uh, and you talk about sending somebody into the presser who has no right to be in the presser? Did you see what she did? It, I think she it's asked, Todd Bowles. She yeah. asked, so let's say you end up going to play in Detroit. Yeah. Well, where else are you going to play? There, we're the number one seed at this point. And then, and then the follow-up question was about the weather. And how they would, you know, be able to adjust to playing in the elements and all that. And you just hear the pause and then he's like, you realize we play in a dome. Yeah. So that, that 20 seconds to get from the bus, I think we can be, I think we're going to be fine. But it was just like, can you imagine that girl's going to go down in infamy? Uh, I mean, look, I, I, I want to say like, I feel for her, but at the same time, you can't. That's like going to the big leagues and not knowing how to hold a bat. Um, no disrespect to her or anything, but you got to be prepared. Um, and, and I do think she was actually talking to Todd Bowles, um, who's the Buccaneers head coach. So she was referencing, you oh, know, okay. the Buccaneers having to go to Detroit, which in your head immediately you're, oh, Tampa's going to Detroit in the middle of, uh, you know, January. But obviously if then you become a football fan, you realize, no, they're in a dome, which – I still think Detroit should have an outdoor stadium. All Northern teams should have outdoor stadiums. We want snow games. But anyways, yeah, that was a tough look. Um, and, you know, I, I, there are some people that are giving Todd Bowles a hard time. And it's like, how are you supposed to answer that question? I'm sorry. Right. Sometimes right. if someone asks you a question that's just ridiculous, what are you supposed to do? Um, especially at that level. Todd Bowles doesn't want to be at that press conference. He doesn't want to answer the best question in that press conference, let alone that one. So. Yeah, um, learning experience, as I always say, you know, my dad told me first time you make a mistake, second time you make a choice. Uh, so it's a learning experience at the very least. But yeah, that, that that's 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 a tough one on that side of it. But uh, with that being said, time to focus our attention to the four games. Look, folks, we have seven football games left this season. That is it. And after this weekend, only three. So we got four this weekend. Enjoy it. As I said, it's kind of our last big hurrah of the season, even though being only four games. But dive right in. Chronologically, first two games will be on Saturday. First one is the Houston Texans at the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, of course, the Houston Texans, excuse me, are the four seed. The Baltimore Ravens are the um, one seed. Ravens are going to be nine point favorites. The over under sits at 44 and a half Raider Jim, your thoughts, Texans at Ravens. You know, my heart tells me that Houston's going to cover. It wants to say that Houston's going to cover Houston's going to make a game of it, but I'll tell you what, watching Baltimore play the last few games of the season, they're just knocking off people like it's nobody's business. Uh, I have, but nine and a half still nine, nine and a half. 
against a hot Houston team. Uh, weather in Baltimore is going to be cold. There's a slight chance of a little bit of snow, but not a lot of snow. Uh, under 40, uh, is it 44 and a half? Uh, yes. Yeah, I would go under 45 in this one for sure. Uh, but I really do think Houston is going to come out there and put together a surprisingly good game. Give me another half point uh, and give me nine and a half on Houston. Uh, Baltimore is probably going to get the win, but Houston's going to make it a game. Yeah, all season I've been, you know, it's a rookie quarterback, it's a rookie head coach. I'm just kind of, you know, doing what my mind tells me, right? As someone who's watched the NFL for so long, it's eventually they got to stub their toe. Eventually, you know, and I thought it was Indy week 17, or, or I guess week 18, and then I thought it was last week against Cleveland. Um, but C.J. Stroud is not to be messed with. And in this one, I'm with you. I, I think Houston covers that nine and a half, or, you know, I'm going to be like you by that half a point. Um, I think they cover that, um, but I would not be surprised to see Houston get the job done. However, sometimes I do have to pull the reins back when my mind starts to wander like that because a lot of times in divisional round, we get that recency bias because we didn't see the Ravens play last week, so we couldn't have been impressed by him, but we were very impressed by Houston, so you kind of almost subconsciously forget about what Baltimore has done, you know, say what they did to San Francisco or what they did to Miami or, you know, X number of teams. Um, so, but with that being said, I think Houston gets the job done. You brought it up. You know, I, I'm looking at it right now. It says 27 degrees um, will be the average temperature during game time. It's going to be cold, but look, plenty of those players in Houston. I believe in Houston, it was like 14 this week. Um, so it's not like they've been, you know, sun tanning down there in Houston uh, like the Dolphins were prior to the Kansas City game. Uh, so I, I could see the weather being a bit of an issue, but I think early on, once they get used to it, once the juices get flowing, throw that out the window. I like Texans to cover nine and a half. Um, I do like the under 44 and a half. And the reason I think that if this does turn into a bit of a shootout and things might get away from Houston, um, that that does worry me, but I would love to see this be a, you know, a 20 to 17 type game. And that'll easily get us there. 21, 17, something like that. Baltimore, their offense is, is kind of like a wrecking ball. Um, they're not going to break through every time, but they're going to, every drive has its purpose, if you will. And later on in the game, that's when they're going to really break through with their run game. Uh, so going forward, keep an eye on that, but I do expect Baltimore to advance, but Houston should cover. And another first, uh, first, uh, I guess, playoff debutante in Jordan Love, who impressed all of us. He is going to take his Green Bay Packers all the way across the country to face the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, the Niners are, of course, the one seed, Green Bay, the first ever seven seed. I know it's only been a few years, but a little bit of history there. First ever seven seed to advance. Uh, the Niners are going to be nine and a half point favorites. The over in this, uh, the over under in this one is at 50 and a half. Um, and just looking at roto weather, it is going to be rainy, uh, about 60 degrees with a 60% chance of rain. So keep that in mind. But Raider Jim, what are your thoughts? Niners, nine and a half point favorites with the over under sitting at 50 and a half. Here's where I take exception, like I often do with these people who uh, handicap the games, if you will. So, only you and I were watching the Packers play against the Cowboys, who's not a team that you can sneeze at. Everybody said that the Cowboys were going to come out and pretty much just have their way with Green Bay and that they were going to just run up the score and Jerry was going to be jumping up and down in his box and all that. And it didn't quite work out that way, but somebody paid attention and said, but Green Bay was not good enough to come out and put a game together against San Francisco. So much so that we're going to give them, we're, we're going to make them an almost 10-point underdog. You have got to be kidding me. I don't see that happening. I don't know that Jordan Love can orchestrate something where he can go down there and take care of business in the rainy San Francisco because it is supposed to rain. But let me tell you, I'll take a whole point on this one. Give me 10 and a half points on the Packers, and I think they can cover that because I think I can see footing being a problem when they need to kick field goals. 
just putting in general. It might turn into more of a running game than anything. Brock Purdy, he's going to be ready. He's going to be, you know, he's going to put it together, but he's been susceptible the second half of the season to make a mistake here and there. He could make some mistakes against Green Bay if they give him the right looks on the defensive side of the ball. So uh, good luck to both teams. I'm not going to be sad whoever loses this one. I'm going to be, you know, congratulations to whoever does move on to that final round for the NFC. But give me Green Bay minus 10 and a half, or plus 10 and a half. And give me, I'm going to take under 51 in this one. I'll take a half point on that. No way that they're going to have a shootout because of that. I don't think the weather is going to allow it. Yeah, the one thing going into that Green Bay, and also, too, I do just want to cut in. Um, this is per Adam Schefter. Mike McCarthy will not be fired this offseason. So the Cowboys are sticking with Mike McCarthy. Um, yeah, <laughs> wow is, wow is right. I'll be honest. I didn't think he was going to make it through that night. Um, but yeah, so Jerry is sticking with him, but anyways, onto the task at hand, um, Green Bay, obviously very, very impressive. And I think besides, you know, Jordan Love did impress me, but the most impressive thing was the Green Bay defense because coming into this game or coming into last week's game, if you talk to any Packer fan, they would say, look, the future is bright with Jordan Love. We're really young, but the defense, um, the defense looked really good last week. Now you can sit here and say, yeah, but it's Dak in the playoffs, blah, blah, blah. That's fine. But I was very impressed with what the Packers brought to the table. This is a bit of a different animal. Um, the one thing I, I would say, one of the big knocks, um, or I guess maybe let's just say where I think Green Bay has the advantage I want to say coaching, and that's not a huge disrespect to Kyle Shanahan. However, the one thing that I'm I've never really been impressed with with Kyle Shanahan is his game management. Now, a lot of the times, his talent and that stuff, they break these big leads. Um, but we, he doesn't play well from behind, or he doesn't coach well from behind, I should say. Uh, so that is something to keep in mind. Matt Lafleur has impressed me. He's kind of like you know, maybe what Nick Sirianni wanted to be, you know, just without the loud mouth. Um, and, and and that's kind of what I see Matt LaFleur as. Very, very bright individual. Um, and I think they hit a home run, not only with the quarterback, but with the coach. With that being said, though, I'm, I'm going to ride the, I'm going to lay the points with the Niners here. I think the Niners are a team. And once again, it's Brandon doubting a young quarterback but I, I just, what I've seen out of the Niners this year against the NFC, the way this past weekend shook out, you know, San Francisco beat the doors off both Dallas and Philadelphia. But I think both of those rosters had enough talent to give Kyle Shanahan a little bit of pause. With all due respect to reigning teams in the NFC talent-wise, I don't know if we have that ability to stack up with the Niners. Now, once again, any given Sunday at 60 minutes, at single elimination, anything can happen. I just think the Niners are too good. I think they get the job done here. I like that nine and a half. I think they win by double digits. Um, and I do like the under, though, because I agree with you. I think the weather is going to be an issue. And I think Kyle Shanahan wants to look at it and, hey, let's let's lower the possessions here. Let's, let's run McCaffrey. Let's run these guys. I don't want to see Jordan Love on the field because he can beat us over the top, and that's, that's not how they want to play. So I think they shorten the game possession-wise, seven, eight possessions for both teams. And we end up around, you know, 24-14. Um, that's kind of where I'm looking at. And uh, we're, we're well underneath that. So I think it's going to be a really, really interesting game. Um, and, and don't sleep on San Francisco. It's been a little while since we've seen them kind of play at Pop Gear because um, I'm trying to think of the last time we saw the Niners actually Obviously, week eight, week eighteen, they played only their backups. But anyways, I know it was week seventeen was kind of when they clinched the home field. Um, but go back in that one, and they they oh, it was against Washington. That's who it was. They they took care of business against Washington, um, and, and and dominated there. So we shall see if they continue on there. Moving to Sunday, it is the other side of the NFC. It's those Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They are heading to Detroit to face the Lions who are in the divisional title game or divisional round, as I said, for the first time since 1991. The Lions are going to be six and a half point favorites. The over-under sits at 48 and a half. 
Raider Jim, what are your thoughts? Tampa heads to Detroit as favorites. Or, excuse Bay me, Buc- Dog. Yeah, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, let's talk in the vernacular of March Madness. These are that five, six seed that all of a sudden gets thrown into a bracket and starts just knocking people off when they're not supposed to. And uh, nobody in their bracket had them picked. Uh, this might be the case up until now. I think Detroit's just really, to me, it, it should come down to Detroit, San Francisco. That's your championship game. But, but, but again, Green Bay's not done. Tampa Bay's not done. Six and a half points. Uh, I think in this one, yeah, maybe go ahead and again, give me another full point. Make it Detroit minus five and a half. I can see them winning by six, not maybe not seven, but by six, uh, 48 and a half points. I'll take the over because it's going to be nice and warm and dry in that stadium. And I think Tampa Bay is going to stick with them a little bit, but I think Detroit's just going to have a little bit more fuel in the tank and they're going to come out and put together another, another good game. My only concern again is, and I'm not saying that Stafford is Mayfield, et cetera, but wow, I mean, when it comes right down to it, Detroit uh, didn't beat that spread last week. They didn't beat the spread last week, and, and yeah, they hung on. Yeah, they got the win, but that's not what anybody expected. People thought that they would really go out, and a lot of people did, thought that they would go out and handle the Rams, although the Rams were playing very, very good ball. Nobody expected it to be a one-point game. Yeah, it was a very interesting matchup there. Even even Sean McVay, um, you know, some of the decision making. I think he kicked a field goal somewhat late to make it a one point game, and I just felt like he should have gone for it. Uh, yes, but you know, once right. again, yeah, I, I don't like to second guess head coaches in those situations because once again, I mean, their toenail clippings have more football IQ than I will ever possess. But in those situations, it's like you know, I've played enough Madden to know that. Should probably go for it, but <laughs> anyways, um, you know, in, in this one, the Lions, I think, jump out to me. I agree with you. I think the over here is going to get um hit. I think we're going to see some points. Neither of these teams' defenses really overall jump out to you. Um, and the one thing that I, I'm interested to see is. A, if Tampa carries over that defensive mentality that they used against the Eagles and very blitz heavy, I think it was 57% of the snaps they brought an extra rusher. Do they continue to do that against Detroit? And conversely, if they do, does Detroit do what the Eagles didn't and adjust? Yeah. Um, you know, so that's going to be something to keep an eye on because I do think Todd Bowles is one of the more forgotten coaches. Um, he, he's kind of, you know, the post Brady and Bill Arian or, um, Bruce Arians, uh, you know, Tampa Bay, you know, whatever saga or era, uh, but he's a really good coach. He's obviously a defensive minded coach. And I think he can bring enough to the table to keep this close. However, six and a half, I'm with you. I, I, I I'll lay six and a half. Um, but I, I will buy a half point to get to six. I see this being somewhat close but the lions in control all game and as good as baker mayfield has been all season i do think the magic runs out a bit and also you go back look the 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 buccaneers wide receivers and those pass catchers they got to figure it out because once again six first half drops i don't know what how much how many they ended with but that's that those are the things that are going to cost you um this part of the season because detroit i guarantee you they will not come out and play as flat as the Eagles. That is a guarantee. So we'll see how Tampa Bay deals with that. But like I said, I do like Detroit to cover six, and I like this going over 48 and a half. Finally, um, the game I think I'm most intrigued by, if you would have told me back in September this is our AFC title game, I would have said, yep, that sounds about right. Um, We're almost there, and it's a little odd. Um, where how we got here, however, for the first time, this blew my mind, Raider Jim, and you already knew this stat, I'm sure, but this will be Patrick Mahomes' 17th playoff game, yeah. and it will be his first true road game. That's absolutely incredible, and also goes to speak for what he has accomplished in you know, as good as he's been in the regular season. But those Kansas City Chiefs, um, they're heading to Buffalo 
to face the Bills. The Bills are going to be two and a half point favorites. And the over under is 46. Um, let me see if my weather um, is still up. Uh, we have partly cloudy in Buffalo. Uh, looks like it's going to be an average of about 20 to 25 degrees compared to last week with Kansas City and really both these teams. That's barbecue weather. Um, so I, I don't see weather being a huge issue in this one. Uh, but Raider Jim, what are your thoughts? Kansas City at Buffalo with the Bills being two and a half point favorites. Yeah, this is going to be good. And it's not going to be the uh, the cut and dry. Oh, obviously, Kansas City is going to go out there and take care of business. Buffalo has been playing some of the best football out there. Uh, these last, you know, that last piece of the season, definitely the second half of the season, they put together some nice runs. Kansas City, as you and I have been saying over the weeks, not the same Kansas City. They're struggling a little bit. I don't know that they're going to be able to put together one good game to get to that next step. And if they do, you know, congratulations. This is a money line game for me. Either way, no matter who I'm picking here, it's going to be money line. But I do have to give the lean to Buffalo right now just by virtue of they're playing more complete football. You talk about throwing some looks. They, were, I saw Von Miller chasing people. I didn't know Von Miller still had gas in the tank, but he was doing pretty good last weekend. Uh, so I like Buffalo in this one on a money line game. Over under 46. Normally you would have said over on this one, but... What I'm wrestling with is Kansas City offense hasn't been putting up points like they used to. It, it, they're, they're getting lucky points. They're working too hard for their points. Uh, and they're just playing. It's almost like they're a little frustrated within themselves. Not, you know, there's not bad blood in the locker room or anything. But, you know, their receivers, you talk about drop balls. That receiving core hasn't given Patrick Mahomes a lot to work with. Even Kelsey has had his days. Um but I still think Buffalo is going to prevail in this one. Uh, and then all the talk's going to start about Kansas City and what they should do in the offseason and Taylor Swift and all that good stuff. How much of a distraction was she and how did that really impact how they played on the field? Uh, but overall, Buffalo's just – Buffalo's dialed in right now. So yeah. give me Buffalo the money line and give me, give me a half a point and I'll go under 46 and a half. I like that. Um, I'm big on Buffalo in this one. I mean, look, the line's minus two and a half. Everyone knows what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, I'm going to take Buffalo minus two and a half. I think they go out and they take care of business. This is, I, it means a lot to both of these teams. Obviously, it's the playoffs. Everyone's playing for a Super Bowl. But this means so much more to Buffalo. Um, Kansas City has been Buffalo's thorn uh, and really all of the AFC upper echelon the last four or five years. Um, and, and this is a game for Buffalo where they've just had this circle. They didn't know when, but they said more than likely we're going to get a chance to get a, a piece of Buffalo or a, a piece of Kansas city. And when we get that, we need to leave no doubt. And the fact that this game is in Buffalo, I think is huge. You brought up Taylor Swift. Yeah. Now look, I don't have millions and billions of dollars, but if there's anyone out there um, that has that type of money, I think uh, quite possibly the greatest content that you could ever get, and and you would have to get plenty of security, but I want to see Taylor Swift walk through Bill's Mafia tailgates. I think that would be the, that would send her and her fans running for the hills because, you know, so one thing I told my coworker who is a big, uh, I think there's Swift, Swifters, Swifties, no, Swifties, Swifters, Swifties, Swifties. I told her, I said, I really don't think Taylor should go to this game. And I sent her some videos of Buffalo Bills fans jumping through uh, tables on fire and things like that. Buffalo is not a family friendly atmosphere. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Um, Bills Mafia is fantastic. However, it's not friendship bracelets and unicorns. It's going to be feisty. It's going to be cold and we shall see. But the, in terms of what's going to happen on the field, I like Buffalo in this one. I think Buffalo goes out, gets the job done. They have been playing playoff football for essentially two months. We go back to that Eagles-Buffalo game. Eagles are 10-1, and one, Buffalo's 6-6, six and six, and now look at where we are. Buffalo hasn't lost since. 
The Eagles seems like they haven't won since. They only won once since then. Um, so give me Buffalo. And in terms of the over-under, I like the under here. I, I see this. I put the cap on this at like 24-20, which will get us home at an under. I see Buffalo covering that and keeping us under. The one thing I will say, and I've been saying it all season, Kansas City's defense, this is the best defense that Patrick Mahomes has ever had. So keep that in mind. Um, I don't know how much of a factor that was last week, whether it was the cold um, or it was truly the defense. I don't know, but I do think we'll get a lot more answer here when you do see them go up against a cold weather team. With all due respect to Miami, I think they were absolutely shell-shocked when they uh, got on the field. Um, and to be honest, look, I'm, I'm kind of bundled up and it's maybe 50 degrees out. So I can't really throw stones, trust me. Um, but at the same time, Buffalo and and in that weather system, a different animal um, for that one. But this is the game I am most excited about. I'm going to be honest. My mom always calls me bitter Brandon um, after my team loses because I usually take a week or two um, and I don't watch any uh, any football or anything. I I will probably watch Kansas City Buffalo. I know for a fact I won't watch Tampa Bay Detroit. Um, I'll check the highlights, but I just I'm not able to watch Tampa right now. But I'm going to be watching this one. I think this is going to be really really good matchup um and i can't wait for it um but once again any taylor swift fans or you know if taylor swift is listening be careful um been forewarned. yeah you have been warned um i sure hope travis has told you or one of your handlers have told you because it is not the same over there in buffalo and it's a playoff game against their hated rival so i'm here for it but i don't know if everyone else uh on that side of the aisle will but raider jim that's all we got for you for our listeners, give us your final thoughts for this divisional round preview. Final thoughts again go to uh, just a lot of congratulations and regardless what side of the fence you're on with the team, uh, you got to give credit to Bill Belichick and uh, what a fantastic thing. The other coach that I want to talk about is I don't know if you happen to catch uh, the broadcast of the Packers and the Cowboys. And when they did their halftime talk, and oh. they were asked, and they asked Jimmy Johnson, "What would you tell these guys?" And Jimmy went off, just flipped the switch, went into the full coach's mode. I saw the replay of it, but I'm watching, and it's like, oh, all of a sudden I'm not sit, slouching on my couch. I'm sitting up. It's like this is good. This is good. And then all of a sudden, Strahan in his yeah, he suit drops down into all into his four point stands and he's like, I'm ready I'm ready <laughs> I mean fantastic and and that's it though these coaches that's that's what you have to appreciate what they're able to do and how they can uh, motivate these guys and again 17 AF, and AFC East championships six super bowls with the same team uh, wow you just can't give enough credit the only reason I would like to see him stay out of the game is so that the five years to put him in the Hall of Fame gets here that much sooner because he's definitely going to be. There. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, my final thoughts kind of around that same vein, obviously. I already kind of brought up Jason Kelsey. Um, he is probably going to be the first of the core four for the Eagles to kind of ride off into the sunset. And of course, I'm referring to uh, Jason uh, Lane Johnson, Fletcher Cox, and Brandon Graham. Um, these four guys in the next two or three years will kind of, like I said, right off into the sunset, whether it be retirement or one final run elsewhere. Uh, it's been an honor watching these guys kind of, you know, I, I don't really like the go to battle analogy, but that's what it is for especially Lane Johnson and these interior linemen. It is, you know, a, a civil battle, if you will. It's not about uh, life and death, but it is about running someone over. Um, and these guys have given a lot. I hope going forward that um, we don't see the ill effects of this game, unfortunately. My favorite player of all time, unfortunately, did succumb to, uh, you know, the, the, the things that happen in this game. Of course, I'm referring to Junior Seau and CTE. Uh, but yeah, and I do think for Jason Kelsey, he's alluded to it. You know, he's 36. 
He didn't want to be deep into his 30s, still playing football, you know, with the brain injuries and things like that. And, you know, he's got a fantastic family, a beautiful wife, beautiful children. Uh, I think it's two girls. Um, and, you know, he's got his hands full. Trust me. Three girls. Thank you. Um, and I think so the youngest one is like six months old. Okay. That's what it, you're right. Yes. Because he, she was going to have the baby around the Super Bowl. I do remember that. So, um, yeah, two kind of toddlers and then a, so trust me, I, he might actually be getting uh, deeper into the trenches uh, in retirement uh, than he was there uh, going up against the Aaron Donalds of the world. Uh, three uh, toddler, three little toddlers might uh, break a man quicker than that. But once again, just, just a congratulations to those gentlemen. And it really is kind of an end of an era in Philadelphia. Obviously, I think we do have a window open with Jalen Hurts and who knows, maybe a, there is another core four blooming um, but I expect 10 years from now, um, Lincoln Financial Field will have five statues. Of course, right now we have the Doug Peterson, Nick Foles, Philly, Philly statue commemorating the Super Bowl. And I think all four of these guys not only get their jerseys retired, um, but I think every single one of them deserve a, tr uh, a statue as well. But with that being said, thank you all so much for listening to this episode of the NFL Weekly presented by the first Off the Bench Podcast Network. Everyone comes off the bench. We are first. It is time for y'all to go wash your hands and stop hating everybody. We'll talk to y'all very soon. Have a great weekend. Be safe.